Thanks, Ruth. <laughs> Uh, and thank you to the Programme Committee for, for the kind invitation. This is my first BES, uh, and it's been great so far. Um, so I've been given the title, um, Postdoc to PI, Making the Transition, um, which to try and squeeze into 10 minutes is, is a pretty big task, and I think we could probably have a whole afternoon symposium on that. What I'm not going to do is go into a huge amount of detail about applying for jobs and how to go about searching for these kind of things. Uh, what I thought would be most useful, particularly given the sort of variety of disciplines we've got, in the room was to kind of give you some broad brush strokes about maybe the kind of things you need to be thinking about if you're thinking about going into a career in academia further down the line. Uh, here's my Twitter and here's the, the conference hashtag as well, so if you've got any comments or questions uh, that you don't go with uh, at the end of today's session, please uh, feel free to, to ping me a, a tweet or whatever on there. Uh, so I ended up on this stage uh, by this route here. I started off doing a, a BSc in genetics here at UCL. Uh, in 2002. Uh, like Jacob, actually, I was a PhD student at the Human Genetics Unit, which is on the north side of town here. Uh, didn't look anything like this when I was a, uh, a student. It was a miserable uh, concrete squat block, which has now uh, been replaced by a rather stunning new institute. Uh, and at the time, I did one of the first uh, combined 1 plus 3 MSc PhD programs and finished that in 2007 uh, in developmental biology and, and genetics with kind of an interest in reproduction. Uh, I then moved over town, north to south, to the Queen's Medical Research Institute here at Edinburgh, uh, which is on the south side at the, uh, at the hospital campus. Uh, and I started off as a career development fellow, which th that was the, uh, the MRC's fancy name for a postdoc uh, a few years ago, uh, and then was lucky enough to, uh, to land a, a small grant, which covered my salary for a couple of years. And so I was a research fellow, funded by Medical Research Scotland for a couple of years. And then that led me to a lectureship at the Royal uh, Veterinary College, which I started in, uh, in January 2013. So I now run a, a little group here, uh, and our interest is in early ovary development, early testis development, and, and signaling in the gonad. So kind of how did I, I get to, to being in this position of, of being an academic researcher? Well, I think it's worth pausing for a moment if you're thinking about this track and thinking about just how many people do get to being a PI, all right? How many of you out of interest, quick show of hands, are, are sort of interested in running your own group at some point? Yeah, a fair number of you, okay. So probably, uh, probably over 50%, all right? Not wishing to put you off, let's look at the numbers, okay? <laughs> so we start off with 100% of PhD students here, all right, and this is the line at the end of PhD. So straight away, 53% of PhD students leave science, okay, at the end of their PhDs. Of that 47% that are left, about 30% go on to do a postdoc, and 17% of that total go into research elsewhere in government and in industry. Those of you who get it through, those who get through a postdoc, um, about 26.5% of the total leave at that point. So around 3.5% of people who started out with a PhD land a permanent research position. So we can kind of take that as being a senior fellow uh, or a lecturer. Uh, and rather terrifyingly, um, only 0.45% make it to professor. So if we, do the, if we do the numbers here and think about this bit here, it actually means that 88% of postdocs leave academia at the end of their, either their second or first postdoc position, which leaves about 12% of all postdocs getting a permanent post, and less than one in 200 PhD students is gonna make it to professor. So whilst I don't wanna discourage you at all, <laughs> the numbers are rather stacked against you. But let's say this is what you want to do. You've decided and you're going to push on. So what do you need to ask? How do you need to get there? Okay. And I think the first stage really is to try and be very self-reflective and ask yourself very, very deeply and think about this a lot. Is this really what you want to do? And I don't mean that in a, God, this is what you want to do. Don't do that kind of way. But to ask yourself, you know, is this really where you want to go? And I think if I, if I think back to three or four years ago, I'm not sure I necessarily had that conversation with myself. I knew I was kind of enjoying the lab work, but I kind of wanted to take away a step away from the bench. Um, I enjoyed kind of coming up with the ideas of, of and planning the direction of the research. Wasn't enjoying actually doing the practical side of it quite so much. So from that kind of point of view, I knew that was kind of the next obvious step, but I don't really think I paused and thought, well, what else could I do? Um, I just kind of trundled on, and I'm very happy doing what I'm, I'm doing currently. It's a, it's a great position. But I think it is worth thinking seriously about, is this where you want to go, and what are the other options? If you are going to go down this track, you've got to be pretty honest with yourself. And so you've got to ask from the, the outset, have you got good enough publications? 
they're going to be discipline specific and, uh, and so I'm not going to put any metrics on that. But realistically, the universities are going to be looking for you to be returned in the research excellence framework probably, so you're going to be looking at four good papers at least. And are you an ideas person, right? Can you look across the breadth of literature? Can you pull out patterns, frameworks and things which you can then apply to your own discipline? Because that's going to be really important down the line. What about your personal circumstances? Do you have a spouse? Do you have children? Are you rooted to a particular place? Are there logistical issues about your research? It's no good going to somewhere that's only got a zebrafish facility if you're planning on doing knockout mouse research for the next three years. Right? That's going to have an impact on where you can go. And certainly for some individuals, there's going to be nationality constraints about where you can work and when. And one thing that actually occurred to me when I was writing this talk was, do you actually know what the job entails? Because I don't think I did, to be honest. I kind of thought, well, you know, I know what lecturers do, I know what PIs do, they go around, they give a few talks here and there, they get invited to conferences to speak. Once a week, they'll have a lab meeting, somebody brings them a bit of cake. They'll wander into the lab with a cup of coffee every so often because, you know, it's against health and safety and all scientists are a little bit resilient like that. But I saw all these scientists and they're, they're all sitting in their offices all the time and I'm kind of thinking, well, what are you doing? Right. And it, it never really occurred to me until, until I got into the job. And I think unless you know this bit, you can't really answer whether you're going to be good at it and whether you're going to enjoy it. So this is a pie chart. This will be a, a lecturer's period of time. And so, you know, a few years down the line, not when you first start out, but most lecturers are going to be looking 40% research, 40% teaching, 20% admin as their, as their breakdown. And if you think, if you happen to be one of those uh, remarkable individuals who manages to be able to do all of their work between 9 and 5 on a Monday to Friday and never has to open their laptop on an evening or a weekend, you can break this down into two days of research, two days of teaching, and one day of admin. Okay. Well, that looks great. You get two days at the bench or four mornings at the bench. Right. No. Because if you think what's actually going to go into that research slot, as a principal investigator, you've got to slot all of these different activities into those two days or four mornings. All right. So starting the collaborations, getting the grants written, doing the reading for the grants, writing the papers, looking after your PhD students, looking after your postdocs, going to conferences, and then right down the bottom there, you might actually get to pick up a pipette, you know, once every few weeks, perhaps. If you think about, if you think about your science um, as two days a week, maybe, then actually if you go off to a, a scientific conference, which is going to be four or six days uh, there and back, that's effectively three weeks of your research allocation gone. Uh, just because you've attended a meeting, which is a rather brutal way of looking at it, and nobody really works that way, but it's worth bearing in mind, I think. So if I still haven't put you off, and hopefully I haven't, you've got to start planning early. So how long have you got left on your contract? That's the first thing you've got to be asking if you're in a postdoc position or you're coming to the end of your PhD. Then you're going to ask, well, when am I going to get the papers out? Okay, when are they going to be published? Because that's going to have quite a big impact on where you can apply and when. Are there some skills that you don't have at the moment that you need to acquire? And if so, how are you going to get them and where are they going to fit into the timescale? If you're thinking of applying for a fellowship, so that's without the teaching, a kind of full-time research role, um, the deadlines on those are quite restrictive. So the MRC and the BBSRC have one deadline a year, and the process takes eight to nine months. The Wellcome Trust has three deadlines a year. So if you're going into that final year of your postdoc, you've really got to work out where you're going to hit in terms of the deadline and then wheel back in terms of several months to get the thing written, um, and then plan, potentially a plan B at the end of it. One thing I think that's worth mentioning, which I certainly benefited from, is the research exercise framework cycle. So this is the big census of research that all of the universities do every four years or so. And in the run into REF 2014, there was a big increase in recruitment about 18 months before the REF. Universities were bringing, re bringing in researchers from other universities so they could put their research forward uh, for that university's return. I certainly benefited from that. And so we're not quite sure what's going to happen with the next ref because the, the organization that organizes it may be dis uh, disbanded next, uh, next month. But if the ref does go ahead in 2018 as planned, from next summer there's probably going to be another spike of, of recruitment into PI position. So it's worth keeping your eye out for that. And it's probably worth having a plan B on top of all of this as well, because um, the whole thing is pretty competitive, success rates aren't great, um, and you're going to need to have a job at the end of it. So if I still haven't put you off, how are you going to move forward? Well, I think one of the key things is to make yourself visible, build a network, 
and get involved. So of course you've got to publish. Your research record is going to be what you uh, stand or fall by. But I think there's a few other bits you want to bolt onto that as well. I think it's really useful to get yourself seen speaking at conferences, and particularly in kind of prize sessions like the early career uh, session today. If I think about the conferences I've been to over the past couple of years, I can't really remember many of the speakers in the parallel oral sessions, but I can remember a lot of them who were in, uh, who were in the, uh, the prize sessions, even if it wasn't in my field. I'd really encourage you to get involved with your learned society, be that SFE, the SRF, the British Society for Neuroendocrinology, and there's a whole different raft of ways you can do that here. I think I've really benefited from this. I was involved quite heavily with the Society for Reproduction and Fertility when I was starting out, and that was a great way as a postdoc of meeting the senior researchers in the field, um, of getting your face known, um, and just meeting these people. Right? And that's useful because those people are going to be the referees on your papers, they're going to be the referees on your grants, and you know, if you're lucky uh, and you get along with them, some of them might even write you a reference, and it's quite nice having a reference from a non uh, per, a person who hasn't necessarily been directly influencing your career. I think within your institutions, try and be as collegiate as you can. Okay? So volunteer to run journal clubs, volunteer to run the seminar program. But a word of warning, particularly I guess those of you who are going into the final year of your postdoc, is try and engage with your PI. Okay? Your PI has got a lump of money to employ you to do a particular project for three years. You doing that bit of work is going to have a big bearing on him getting his next lump of money, okay? And it's going to have a big bearing on where you go next as well. Sometimes it's going to be a tension there between you wanting to start up pilot projects, wanting to uh, go and start doing all these extra activities on top of that. Just bear in mind that you're being paid to do a particular, a particular job, all right? And I think it's very easy if things aren't going so well as a postdoc to start burying yourself in some of these activities as a bit of a displacement, and, uh, and that's something to try and avoid. I'd really recommend trying to get a bit of teaching experience. Um, demonstrating and things are not too bad, but what have you actually got out of that, okay? I think it's really good if you can be doing some student supervision. Uh, PhDs and MRes is great, uh, honors projects. But particularly if you can get a bit of funding yourself as a, as a postdoc or a PhD student to take on a, a summer studentship. So that shows you've applied, it shows you've come up with an idea, and that somebody's reviewed that, given you the money, and you've been able to run that project yourself. Great if you can get a few lectures or small te group teaching uh, opportunities. Your bosses, you're probably very keen to get rid of some of their teaching. Uh, so volunteering there is no bad thing. And if you've got a, an online digital ability, um, I think this is really going to be the next thing. Um, most of the universities are going into having a lot of digital media. Uh, and so if you've got skills on that front, they'll be very useful. I think it goes without saying that you've got to show that you and uh, your ideas are fundable. So a number of the relevant societies have got early grant career schemes for up to 10,000 pounds that'll uh, allow you to uh, get a bit of seed funding to, to get a project started. Undergraduate summer studentships can do that as well. And even better than those is these kind of postdoctoral fellowships which will support your salary for a couple of years. So Layla, the EMBO Molecular Biology Organization and the Marie Curie Actions. But I'd really say one of the key things is making use of who and what's around you. So get your research ideas and your CV um, looked at by the people around you, the people you trust, okay? Get them to give it a kicking. It's good, it's better for them to give it a kicking than for it to go out to a, a reviewer uh, or a panel and then take it apart, okay? I'd strongly recommend getting yourself a rant buddy. I can't sort of, uh, I can't underestimate how useful it was to have somebody's office to go to, uh, open the door, sit down and just let rip about how unfair the whole process is um, and how annoyed I was with this, that, and the other, okay? Uh, and particularly if that's a senior person, that's great because they'll happily listen, they'll empathize, and then they'll talk you down and try and find a resolution to it. And I try and use what else is around you, so industrial opportunities, training courses, and really kind of milk your contacts in your network, okay? It's no good making a big network of contacts if you're not going to use it. So if you find, if you hear on the grapevine there's a job coming up, and you know somebody in that department, ping them an email and ask them about it. Susan mentioned Vitae, so uh, we're just going to look at a couple of the resources that are available. Uh, so this is a great website, tons of stuff on how to progress your academic career. There's this uh, little wheel here which shows each of the qualities that uh, we're looking for in developed researchers. And Vitae also has a system where you can actually benchmark 
uh, where your skills are at and identify some areas that you can then move on, uh, areas of weakness perhaps that you've got to get some training in to develop. And of course, there's the Society for Endocrinology Career Development Workshops. So these are going to be run late February, and these provide an opportunity for early career researchers to try and map out their career and get some expert input uh, into fellowship ideas and grant applications and so on and so forth. Make friends with jobs.ac.uk. Okay? You're going to be spending a lot of time together. I don't have any shares in them, I'm not plugging them, but all of the kind of UK-based jobs are mostly listed on here. They do a really neat little thing where they'll email you all the relevant jobs on a morning, and all the lectureship opportunities and PI positions are going to be on here. So uh, I would recommend this as being a great first port of call. So with that, I'm just going to leave you with a few take-home messages. Start planning early. Be proactive, OK? Your career is in your hands. Nobody's going to come along and say, oh, you should apply for this, or oh, why haven't you applied for that, OK? People are very happy to back you. And in fact, in my experience so far, everyone's been extremely supportive and enthusiastic whenever I've said I wanted to go for something. But it has to come from you originally. Don't list things, OK? Don't start doing activities, those extra bits and pieces, just to get them on the CV, all right? Do them because you're interested and because you think they'll be useful, but also try and get some outcome out of it, OK? So if you did a bit of teaching, what came out of the other end? Did you improve the scores? Did the students do better on the exam, OK? When you go for the interview, being able to link up that what you've done with what came out the other end is really powerful. I'd recommend building a bit of job hunting into your daily routine. And, yeah, and I can't stress this enough to, to finish with, is, is to have a life outside science. And I think this is something I've only realized very recently and, and rather belatedly. Um, and I think it's really important. This is a job that we all love doing. It's a job that kicks us, knocks us from pillar to post, uh, and then expects us to get up so it can do all over again. And you've got to be pretty resilient to do that. And I think if you're in the lab every day in, day out, doing the same thing, you start to, to not see the wood for the trees. Okay? You're not thinking about, uh, you're not being at your best, but you're also not having the space to be developing the ideas that you need to get good grant um, applications and ideas and stuff. So make sure you've got some own um, outside interests. Make sure you have a bit of downtime. If you don't go in on a Saturday, what's going to happen? All right. Sales might be a bit grumpy, but the sky's not going to fall in. So work hard, but bear in mind there's a limit. And I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you.